Hello there, welcome to another series on BET series, another lesson in BET series. Biologists explain this. I still remain your biology tutor, Peter Sabiodo, and I say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the part of the world you are listening to me from. Now we are beginning a series on the very interesting topic which is central to physiology and the topic is homeostasis. As you see on the screen there, it's interesting because homeostasis talks about how the body tries to maintain balance between, fluctu between the different functions of the body because there are fluctuations that the body has got to contend with. So in this lesson, we'll be going through the stages or let's say the principles because this is the first in the series and so this particular lesson will be laying the foundation to what we'll be discussing in subsequent lessons so come along and let's enjoy this lesson together now let's begin by trying to go through our learning objectives by the end of this lesson you will be able to one explain what is meant by homeostasis and its importance and be able to explain the principles of homeostasis and explain the mechanisms of negative feedback control and also be able to explain the concept of positive feedback so let's begin to consider homeostasis in much deeper depth now the word was coined from greek words of course by Walter Bradford Cannon was in 1926, but before then, there was a French physiologist, Claude Barnard, that broached the subject that first delved into the concept of how the body self regulates itself. So, even though we're talking about what Cannon did, he was not the pioneer actually, somebody had already worked before him, which is which was a French physiologist called Barnard. And then, of course, you can imagine science always evolves, and then his work was not given much consideration until the canon began to review it in his book. And in his book, he began to talk about how the, the body of humans is wired or designed to maintain steady levels of certain conditions in which the cells exist. And that particular idea has been found to obtain in the larger ecosystem also if you look at it you've got cycles that you learned in biology topics you've got the car the carbon cycle the oxygen cycle water cycle nitrogen cycle all these cycles they try to teach the concept of balance okay so we are so even though we are discussing the body you note that a lot of other processes in nature are also programmed to maintain a kind of balance because if you have a deviation from what is expected that there, there's going to be a breakdown of stability in nature so nature tries to even even if you look at your food chain in ecological structure no predator should be much more than the prey that's why in natural ecosystems very large top consumers are very rare because what energy will sustain them at the top and so I'm just trying to let you know for the sake of introduction that it's not only in the body that you have homeostatic principles. We are going to see more as we go on in this lesson. And so, still on the introduction, now look how this statement is it's, it's explanatory enough because it's talking about the fact that all processes that you have, okay, there's an integration, there's a coordination, and even is it's also talking about even circuits in in in, this, in the homes all of these they, they they are homeostatically regulated so it's still buttressing what i said while explaining the previous slide about the fact that homeostasis pervades different sphere of our lives and so we proceed to look at the forms of homeostasis okay you'll be very very surprised you find this intriguing to see the different forms that homeostasis takes this is not everything but just the key ones that this lesson is meant to cover now we have we've got sleep homeostasis and there's something called the sleep rhythm okay uh, the sleep rhythm is such that um, by the time you get into a particular period of the day like around 10 p.m on there about your system begins to shut down, you begin to feel drowsy, meaning your system is telling you shut down, 
reboot in, in codes so that I can be refreshed to work much more efficiently. And so there is this thing in, in physiology called the non-rapid eye movement, which precedes sleeping. And so if every time you try to suppress sleep for any reason whatsoever, you are studying, preparing for an assignment or something, and you go against this rhythm, now you are going to pay the price because at the next opportunity or any kind of opportunity to have to sleep, you are going to oversleep because the, the rhythm has to be observed. So first of all, we have the sleep homeostasis, which tries to balance staying awake and trying to sleep. Then you've got the cellular activity homeostasis. That, that talks about the various processes within cells. There's a balance between, like if you remember our lesson on, on enzymes, we talk about the, the, the processes that release energy, hexagonic processes and endagonic ones that the cell try to maintain a balance between energy releasing processes that we call hexagonic processes and endagonic processes like photosynthesis that use energy. We are going to talk about this as we proceed. And then we've got the neuronal homeostasis. This talks about the balance between electrical activity and chemical signaling. Now, there are two systems of communications that nature has designed. Plants have only one communication system, and that is chemical. They've got their own plant growth regulatory substances. So you've got things like uh, auxins, you've got gibberellin, you've got abscisic acid, cytokinins, and ethylene. Those five substances are found in plants. So plants regulate uh, and they communicate different parts of the body with one another chemically. Okay, that's hormonally. But animals have both electrical, which is neural, and chemical, which is hormonal. And so that's also a kind of homeostasis discussion. Then you've got the energy homeostasis, a balance, like I said previously, a balance between taking in energy, okay, and that's making, because there are many processes like muscle contraction, active transport, for example, that utilize energy, and energy releasing processes like aerobic respiration. So, yeah, so the cell also tries to have a balance in this context. on the front of energy we got cardiovascular homeostasis okay now every time the blood gets to the capillaries there is ultra filtration going on and then you've got the plasma being fluid being filtered together with substances that are equal to or about less than 65,000 relative molecular mass rmm they are filtered through the walls the thin walls of the capillary and so the question is how much blood should be retained within the salivary system and how much blood should, should be filtered. So there's a balance because you need the tissue fluid, but what you also refer to extracellular fluid, fluid to bathe the cells so that they, they, they can obtain what they want, oxygen, glucose, and the rest. They come through the, 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 the filtered blood, which we are referring to as tissue fluid or the extracellular fluid. And so there's an exchange. And so the, there's a balance, there's a need for a balance between these supplies of different parts of the body. And so when you're communicating, there has to be a balance. Okay, you can't just filter the blood entirely. It has to be a balance eventually. Otherwise, there's going to be a problem because mammals like humans or humans that like, like mammals, they, we've, we've got a closed system of circulation. The only means of exchange through the salivary system is across the walls of the capillaries. And so you've got the cellular communication feedback, you've got a temperature regulation, fluid balance. These are just examples of things that you have to regulate in the cardiovascular system. Still on the front of homeostasis, we've got protein homeostasis. Now, there are a lot of proteins in the body that we have to maintain. Too much protein in the blood can attract water and lead so that because proteins can make the blood to have a more negative solute potential, meaning the blood can become concentrated. And so water comes in from neighboring cells, from the blood, and then you can have an edema, a swelling as it were in that tissue. And, and so proteins have to be managed, not too much, not too little. So the, so, so, so the fluids will not be, have will not be too negative in their solute potential, not be too positive also. So because high water potential can lead to swelling. Okay, so those are the things that we do have. So there's a balance. So the different proteins, what we are referring to in this context, the proteomes that we have, 
you've got to have a proteostasis so that's the balance between the different proteins in the body fluids there's got to be a balance you can't just have proteins anyhow because proteins contribute to the solute potential of the body fluid so too much or too little also can cause a problem it can indicate a dysfunction that there's a proteins that you have in, 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 in the urine that can indicate danger concerning the malfunctioning of the kidneys. And so, st still on this forms of homeostasis, we've got also adaptive homeostasis. Okay, so now the, the systems of the body that are concerned with homeostatic regulations, they have to make sure that short term adjustment because. The, 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 the changes, the regulations are not to be long term because what homeostasis does is to prevent large fluctuations from what is favorable concerning the factor that the body is going through. Like temperature, for example, the norm or the set point that what is favorable is about 37 degrees Celsius, what we consider as the room or body temperature. And so when you begin to have something higher than that, is a problem and it's lower than 37 is a problem also and so there has to be a, a how do we regulate it such that it's not too far it's the same thing with blood glucose level how much regulation is required so that I still maintain the osmotic potential and the water potential of the blood plasma at the same time and so this issue of blood fluid homeostasis is is all important because that's that's the aspect of what you call osmoregulation the balance between the solutes and the body fluids not too much of solute otherwise water is drawn into that region and there will be a swelling and not too little otherwise water goes out and that's a shrinkage of the cell so note all these different forms of homeostasis having discussed the forms of homeostasis we go to energy and homeostasis you find that interesting we said that at the introductory stage of this presentation that there's a need to manage energy of course we said in our lesson on enzymes that you can't set the body on uh, let's say you can't heat the body so to say we said in that lesson on enzymes that the processes the reactions in cells if they were carried out in the laboratory setting the conditions can change now you can get your beaker or any container put on the bonsim burner and heat it up even up to 80 or even boiling temperature of 100 degrees Celsius you can't do that with the body because the body has lots of proteins that will be denatured and damaged enzymes for example are very sensitive to temperature changes so you have to manage the temperature of the body or the temperature within which the cells function within a narrow limit so there is the need not to have too little energy because there are processes that will require a particular amount of energy for example nervous transmission requires energy so for your brain to process stimuli information getting to it it needs energy muscles to contract as you are listening to me now your heart is beating cardiac muscles are beating because they are getting energy and so energy management is very important and so you've got to understand that um, the pH also is important so a lot of things revolve around the energy concepts within cells and and the body as a whole now remember the, the issue of diet is very central to this whole thing for example now how do you have a balance between expenditure and intake now Gaining weight is not um, anything magical. It's not rocket science. Gaining, gaining, now apart from individuals who have genetic issues with gaining weight, because if weight issue runs in the family, automatically the person is in the trouble already. But some people, it's not, it's, it's, it's not genetic. It's not dietary indiscipline, indiscriminate eating. What I would call small regular excesses, high calorie food, chocolate. They, they all these pastries and the rest of them and you are eating this stuff you are not being active if you see children for example most often children don't gain weight because they are very metabolically active as they are eating they are running up and down and they are, they are burning off but as we grow older metabolism slows down 
he went through school, he got a good job, you have a car, maybe chauffeur driven or something, or you even drive yourself, you don't do laundry anymore, you have, you've got a remote control at home, even the car, everything is electronic now. Life has become much more convenient. So if your intake is higher than your expenditure, meaning you are not active, you are not burning. So you see individuals having problem with weight gain because of indiscipline with their diet. So there has got to be balance between energy intake with when you eat and the kind of exercises, the kind of activities we go through. That's very important. So note, there's energy mysticism that we have to consider because it's part of the whole purpose of this lesson. And then there is the concept of homeostasis and reflexes. Okay, and you've got protective reflexes if you if you if you're eating something that is uncomfortable. There's a reflex that makes you to vomit. If you inhaled some a fume or something that is unpleasant or irritational, suddenly you begin to sneeze or cough. And so there's protective reflexes when you inhale fumes or what is irritating your nasal passage, what you call the airways. And then you vomit also if you feel irritated by the food, maybe the taste or whatever, we vomit. So vomiting is reflex because it's trying to ensure that you don't take in what will be um, pleasant to the body. And so you have your eye blink reflex, okay, balance between seeing and trying to relax the ciliary muscles of the eye lens. So all of these are things that you've got withdrawal response also. How do you withdraw your foot? How do you change your position when you are seated? All of these are, are also part of homeostasis. Reflexes are actions that we don't have control over. And so when you want to vomit, you, you don't, you didn't plan to vomit. It, sometimes it just happens. Of course, you can control it sometimes, but there are times that it, it just happens on its own. Okay. And so the, the idea behind it, just like somebody else who, who, who was drunk, for example, and also decides to go and eat. Now, food is not friendly with alcoholism. And so an alcoholic that is eating is going to be embarrassing himself or herself by vomiting. So there, there, are, there are reflexes to consider when it comes to homeostasis comes in also in the context of reflexes. So we've been talking about so many things about this. So sneezing, coughing, vomiting, eye blink, withdrawal of your arm or your foot, all of these are also aspects of homeostatic control mechanisms. Let's look at the problem of disruption of homeostasis. If, if homeostasis were to fail in a particular body, now the breakdown of homeostatic process indicates a failure or a malfunctioning of a particular pathway or a particular set of organs in the body. Very, very apt to remember. Now imagine somebody else who is diabetic, for example. Now blood sugar level is about 90 milligrams, and that is just the average figure, but 90 milligrams in 100 ml of blood. So the range is about 90 milligrams to I mean 70 milligrams to 90 milligrams in 100 ml of blood. So picture your beaker, for example, a 250 ml beaker, okay? Go down to 100, then you get the picture of what we are trying to say. That is what is considered favorable. Now imagine for some reasons of breakdown or the malfunctioning of the pancreas or the liver. The, or even the kidney, because in the in the proximal tubule of the kidney, okay, the kidney, nephrons, what also, so in the nephrons, what to call the urinary tubules of the kidney, sugar is completely and entirely reabsorbed into the capillaries surrounding that region, what you call the pertubular capillaries. So you've got sugar being completely reabsorbed into the pertubular capillary surrounding the proximal region. So the filtrate that is getting to the loop of Henle should not have sugar at all. And so if you have somebody else urinating and sugar appears, what you call glycosuria, is a is an indication that something is wrong. So sugar should not even be in the free filtrate that is reaching the distal convoluted tubule, let alone appearing in the urine. And so aging, okay, living long longevity they are indications that our system is weakening and we are, we are losing homeostatic regulatory 
mastery. So the body gets weaker and weaker. So a lot of these of the old age, they are indicative of the breakdown or the slowing down or the depreciation of the hemostatic processes that once existed before in the body. That's why as, as you grow older, you see that older people are more susceptible to infections, respiratory problems, bone issues, and things like that because there's a breakdown or a slowing down or a weakening or a depreciation of hemostatic processes as we age. Still on disruption of hemostasis, every medical condition can be traced back to failure, a failure of something, meaning something has gone wrong. So it's either the, the receptors, the part of the body that is concerned with sensing, registering, monitoring has failed. So you can have a failure to detect a deviation. So the blood pressure has, has gone up, it's not being noticed. The blood glucose level has gone up or has crashed. So you can have hyperglycemia, too much sugar in the blood. You can have hypoglycemia, too little, less than required. It's, if it's not detected, then it, the body keeps running until when the body breaks down eventually because there's a malfunctioning going on that has gone long for some time unnoticed. And then, of course, failure to initiate a feedback loop, meaning what is supposed to be negative because when you have negative fever, we talk about that in, in subsequent lessons after this, you begin to have a, 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 an increase leading to further increase or a decrease leading to further decrease. So in other words, the fluctuation or the deviation from the normal set point, it's being intensified. So it's getting worse as it is. And so a couple of failures can result or can indicate that homeostasis is not running as is expected to be in that body. Still on disruption of homeostasis, so loss of receptor sensitivity with aging increases the risk of illnesses. And so the, the issue of advocating individuals that are aging to, to do some exercises, okay, some things that increase sensitivity of receptors. So the agility of the person, despite the weakening of the body, is very important. Light exercises to improve reflexes of the knees and things like that. All of these are important. So like I said previously, susceptibility to diseases and dysfunction, they are very common as we age because there's a weakening. The immune system has become compromised, not the way it once used to be. So let's look at the features or what you can refer to as the characteristics of homeostasis. Now, in, in terrestrial warm-blooded animals, okay, of course, what we call warm-blooded, the homeothermic vertebrates are birds and mammals. And so certain conditions require homeostatic regulation. And so you have a couple of them littered, lifted so, I mean, look at the list. Now you've got the body temperature, fluid balance, that's almost from regulation, blood pH, that is the level of acidity or alkalinity of the body of fluid. You've got oxygen tension, which should be brought low because you don't want to have too little oxygen because if you don't have enough oxygen, aerobic processes will not produce ATP to power active processes in the body. Of course, you've got homeothermic organisms having to obtain nutrition to make up for the energy. One of the reasons why we eat is to supply energy to power active processes in our body. Let's look at the scope of homeostasis. What does it cover? Okay, we've seen the forms, we've seen the, the features, the characteristics. Now let's look at the scope. Now, the scope of homeostasis is to balance, balance the different systems, the different processes going on within the body. None of these processes should be too fast or too slow or too high or too low. There has to be a balance. If you look at the slide that began this, this lesson, it showed a balance somewhere. Okay, so in, in homeostatic processes, you, the body tries to ensure that narrow limits are maintained. Of course, you cannot avoid fluctuations. It's not possible. Now, just after digestion of food, for example, no, please, not after the meal, after digestion. It takes hours to digest the food completely in the gut, the alimentary canal that is. 
but after digestion sugar is absorbed from the helium of the small intestine across the the, the wall of the ileum because the, what's called the villi those folds that increase surface area of absorption food that is glucose is absorbed into the hepatic portal vein to be transported to the liver and other parts of the body so but to deliver first off and so from the liver to other parts for absorption so the idea is that if you're looking at this it has, there's, there's a need to consider this balance okay you are going to have to self-regulate okay and the whole idea of homeostasis is simply put if there's nothing remember from this lesson remember is not to prevent fluctuations because the body can't just be stable imagine when you were afraid you had gunshots adrenaline was released and then it it caused an increase in your heart rate and your breathing rate so your your uh, when you are at rest you have like six, 72 beats so your heart beats on the average 72 beats in 60 seconds that's eight minutes and so you can go up to 90 something when you are free because when you are anxious and you are afraid there's increased pressure and fear and anxiety there is a need for blood to pump to, have to be pumped more because blood supplies oxygen and glucose that will react together to give you atp in aerobic respiration and so to imagine that when your blood pressure went high okay it rose and then your breathing rate also increased you remain like that and imagine you couldn't respond to any stimulus because you are maintaining a constant so what homeostasis is all about is to maintain a steady state when you're trying to be steady you move to the left sometimes move to the right so if you watched circus guys before those those clowns those those those, those guys that walk on on the rope if you look at them they will have this 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 pole in their hands okay of course for safety there'll be a net beneath because no matter how much human errors can arise okay so they've got a pole that they hold in their in both of their hands while they try to walk the rope and you see the audience trying to hold their breath because they are wondering look at this man look at the height of the stunt is trying to play on them and so you, 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 because the guy is saying that look I need to maintain a balance so when it's trying to move to the left to the right that's a steadiness like broad on a wire and so what we're trying to say is that the scope of homeostasis is not to prevent deviations not to prevent fluctuation because things will fluctuate temperature will go up and down heart rates will go up and down because we are responding to environmental and also internal stimuli what homeostasis does is to prevent large fluctuations it shouldn't go too far your blood glucose level should not reach 150 let alone 180 okay the temperature should not even reach 40 let alone 45 or 50 degrees Celsius so that's the idea your blood pressure should not go beyond 16 kilopascal over 10 kilopascal what is discarded as average of 120 millimeter mercury over 80 mm hg those are the kinds of things so the scope is to prevent large deviations from the norm or what we also call the set point on the scope just a couple of things that we have said over and over again about the kind of things that homeostasis covers so the partial pressure of oxygen what we could be talking about um, proteasomes what you have to maintain level of proteins okay and then you've got um, temperature regulation hormone level you can't have too much of insulin because you're going to crash the blood glucose level and that will make the blood to have high water potential because sugar level has dropped below what's expected and of course electrolyte ions there's need to maintain ionic balance also and so if you've got questions or you are practicing questions please get in touch okay now you can get in touch with me through the whatsapp number my email instagram handle and youtube if you also I'm, if you have been enjoying our lessons please like share comment let your friends know if you are an a-level candidate preparing for Cambridge examination I, I, I can partner with you I can help you in terms in terms of how to understand how to answer questions because the issue of advanced level biology is how to interpret question and if you can't interpret questions in context 
you are not going to be able to answer very well even though you've understood you see you read the concept you understood the concept and the principles how to answer questions so if you are interested in online tutoring i can partner with you from anywhere in the world thank god for i for internet there's no there's no barrier anymore to communication we can use zoom we can use google meet all kind of means can be used to discuss you remember you don't have to fail you don't have to suffer in silence we can work together we're here to help and so in that examination you're preparing for we at bet we wish you the very best knowing fully well that you are meant to succeed and not to be a failure so again like share and send your comments in and let others benefit from what you have been there from so if you've enjoyed this lesson join us in the next lesson as we continue homeostasis in details and also go on our youtube channel and see other videos that you can learn from in terms of preparing for your examinations see you next time bye